go ahead and get started on our next session with uh, another group of some super phenomenal women. And we will first start off oops, with welcoming to the stage Nilfer Merchant, who's CEO, strategist, and author. Particular moments allow us to define who we are, or rather, they allow us to redefine who we are becoming. And sometimes in that moment, we might see ourselves as rogues or misfits, but we might also see ourselves as heroines. Fifty-five years ago today, last week actually, Rosa Parks sat on a bus, and she said, I will not move and give up this seat for a white passenger. She said at the time she was sick of giving in. And I wonder, as history has captured so much of her, the public moment of this and celebrated her contribution to our history, I wonder what she was actually thinking in that private moment, you know, that internal moment that's going on of choice. I wonder if she was sitting there with her 1950s bag in her lap thinking, I will not let you define me by my, st my status, by my color. Now, some stories are not as profound as Rosa Parks. Take the story of Susan Boyle. We remember her from Britain's Got Talent. When she showed up on stage, and people, the audience, were sort of like looking at her like, uh, uh, no thanks. You could kind of see them doing that, right? Because she showed up as a rather frumpy, dumpy woman until she started to sing. And the audience went wild. But in that internal moment, she was saying to us, you will not define beauty based on my size or my age. And the stories of Rosa Parks or Susan Boyle are happy stories in how they've ended. But some of the stories are still happening. They're happening in places far away from us in distant times in different cultures. In Africa, for example, young girls leave home at an incredibly early age to avoid something called female genital mutilation. And FGM still happens today. There are 28 sub-Saharan countries where this is the norm. And while it's been outlawed in 14 of those countries, very rarely has that law been enforced. And so as that girl is saying to us, my body is not property to do with as you wish. Which reminds me in some ways of my own story. You see, I came here when I was five years old. And I was raised in a very traditional house coming from India to have an arranged marriage. And my brother and sister had gotten arranged marriages. And as the youngest, it was fully expected that I would do the same. And in many ways, I honored that tradition because I knew it was one way for me to take care of my mother who had raised us after her divorce. And one day, I came home from community college, which was what I was doing to kind of bide time until I could go to real school. And I found my aunties had filled the house because the arrangement had been made. So I took aside my mom. And I said, so did you ask about school? And she said, no, no, we do not ask about that. Because there are other things that are more important. She wanted a house for herself. She wanted other things that she really needed. And to her, to ask for this was disrespectful of her role in it. So I took my uncle aside and I asked him. And I said, you know, my reasoning is really simple. I knew that he was wealthy. I knew that he had, because I saw his staff. He had staff that managed his mansion. He had a nanny that had taken care of his ch child by his first marriage whose wife had died. So I just knew that if you just ask him, he would say yes. And they would not relent. And so what I thought, you know, being raised in a Western culture, I thought, well, I got to have some power in this situation. And so I thought, what if I move out for just a day or two? Then they'll relent, and I, none will be the wiser. And I'll be in like Flynn, right? But they did not relent. And in fact, I, I suppose if I had to put a bubble over my head, it, was, it would be something like, I will not be denied an education because of my gender. But 
in that moment, they did not relent, and I was out of family and home. And the actual questions that were running through my mind was not nearly as cogent as, I will not be denied my education. It was more like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and really, what I was asking myself in that moment is, who will I be now? And I suppose that's a question for all of us when we're going through that moment of reinvention. Am I focused on what is, or can I think about what will be? The questions that were running through my mind is, who am I to want this? You know, my family called me everything, rebellious, disrespectful, and I was. Who am I to want this? And I asked myself, who will I piss off? And I had a pretty big list going. <laughs> and how will this turn out? How will I eat? And where will I sleep? And this is perhaps a question that Rosa Parks was asking herself, right? Because Rosa, of course, in her generation, still had to go home to her mom or her church community and be called an uppity black woman. And very few people remember that she lost her job that day after being arrested. She lost her job as a senior person. It took her years, years, to find another one. She actually had to move to a different city to do that. And I wonder if Susan Boyle, right before she went on stage and had that glorious moment that we celebrate, I wonder if she was thinking about her childhood nickname, which was Simple Susan, and thinking, who am I to sing this big? And the African girl who is leaving her home, her tribe, her community, everything she knows, she is literally going out into the wilderness. And she will probably have to travel hundreds of miles before she finds safety or a community that even understands why she's making the decision she's making. What is she thinking? Maybe she's thinking about her younger sister and about how her choice will impact others. And you know, each of us faces those decisions too. We've all gone through this moment of reinvention. It may not look like the stories of Susan Boyle or Rosa Parks. It may look like a divorce. It may look like a crushing diagnosis. It may mean a move, a new job, or the loss of a job. And the question for us is, how do we handle this moment, this internal moment? What are the choices we put before us? I believe that we are always in this creative act because who we've been in our history is only part of our story of who we are because also as part of that story is who we aspire to be, who we're becoming. And there are times perhaps when that choice is worth it more than others, to think about what is it I really want and when is it really worth, me, with, worth it for me to own that voice. And I'll offer three things for when I think it's worth it and leave it to you to kind of think about your own moments. And one, and this is a piece of research that was done by some Berkeley profs that says when people own their point of view, then causes a group to think better it's been proven out in jury research. It's been proven out in teamwork. It's been proven out in innovation work. That when, even when the people are wrong in their opinion, that those minority viewpoints cause people to turn over that rock, you know, and think about it fully, kind of think about how could we solve for it. So maybe sometimes when you're sitting there in that meeting and thinking, hmm, should I say something or shouldn't I? Maybe you could think about how you're influencing the group. There's also a time when you allow other people to have their voice. So there's been research that shows that people conform to group will. So if 90% of the room is saying one thing, 70% of the group will actually say the exact same thing, even if they know their own answer to be different. But if they can hear divergence in the room, that conformity number goes from 70 to 30. So by giving your own voice permission, that you are allowing others to do the same. And finally, sometimes there is in our life a cost that is too big. For me, it was education, and it's why I celebrate the day I got a degree from Santa Clara University, and I celebrate that institution, because the cost was too big for me, for who I was meant to be. And for you, whatever that is, your story, where you are becoming who you are meant to be, 
You have to think about, at this moment, is the cost too high for me not to speak my truth and not for me to own my future? We are always in this creative act, in this tension between who we've been and the history and the customs and the norms and conformity, and the opportunity in our own stories as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for your personal story. Next, we welcome to the stage uh, Shiro Sharanya, uh, CEO and co-founder of Women Startup 2.0. 